afternoon and welcome to this edition of Eyewitness Newsmakers. I'm your host, Doug Miller. On March the 23rd, chemists Stanley Pons and Martin Fleischmann rocked the world of science. They announced that they had achieved cold fusion in their laboratory at the University of Utah. The promise of a cheap and a plentiful energy supply grabbed the world's attention. And the two chemists were swamped by the news media, questions about this big development. Finally, they had to stop talking about it and spend time working on the very science they had created. So we're happy to have both gentlemen with us today to talk about the progress of cold fusion at this point. Dr. Stanley Pons with the University of Utah and Dr. Martin Fleischmann with England Southampton University and also a research scientist now at the University of Utah. Gentlemen, we're pleased to have you with us. Also joining us today is Eyewitness News Science Specialist Ed Yates. Ed, of course, uh, has covered a lot of science stories over the years, but few, Ed, you have to admit, compare with the story of cold fusion. In fact, uh, little poll in the newsroom here uh, just recently indicated that it was the top story of 1989. Yes, I, I don't, don't think Dr. Flashman and Dr. Pons are aware that the, in that vote that it has become the number one story uh, of, the, uh, of the year. <laughs> Ed, uh, in terms of the, the development of this story over the years and uh, the, the aspects of it that you followed, it, it must have been maybe one of the more challenging stories in your career. Oh, by, by by any standard, uh, Doug, I think uh, the artificial heart was a pronounced story in this area. But uh, the story of Dr. Fleischman and Dr. Pond's uh, uh, research development has, uh, has taken the world by storm, and it has developed a controversy that is unequaled. Uh, certainly the artificial heart was controversial, but certainly not, as, not by any de degree that this story has become. Gentlemen, it's been a couple of months since we've had an opportunity to visit with you uh, to any degree. You've uh, sort of kept yourselves at arm's length from the media and from the world that wants uh, that hungers for information about this uh, the status of the experiment where are you now what's developed in the last couple of months well, in the last two months we have uh, devoted ourselves to finishing the major paper the key paper uh, the definitive paper uh, that we started uh, we are now ending that period and we are uh, we'll be sending that out in the next few days so no. uh, perhaps I could Add there, we, because of the controversy which was generated, we felt obliged to do complete two further complete sets of yeah. tests. And that was completed in the end of October. Well, let me just ask you, gentlemen, about this, uh, <clears throat> this new paper that you're about to publish. The calorimetry was, was one of the areas that was highly debated early on in this experiment. And I would assume in this paper that you have answered and addressed all of your critics as far as the calorimetry is concerned. Is, is that one of the key points in this paper? We've been careful to answer as many uh, of the criticisms that have been made. Uh, we, I don't think anything particularly new has been added other than, uh, to the paper uh, than we gave, than, uh, I mean, particularly new in, in, that in the respect that uh, we determined uh, our results by the same methods. We have sharpened them up. We have determined, you know, the maximum error limits that we could possibly have had in those experiments. Uh, and that, in that respect, that's, uh, that will be new items in the paper. And I guess we should, for, for the viewer, uh, mm -hmm. explain that when we talk about calorimetry, we're talking mm -hmm. about the technique used, specific technique used to measure the heat. There is, uh, if I could just add something to that, there is, in this particular research, a need to test a very large number of samples. So no matter how much money you have got, you've got to go for a reasonably inexpensive method of carrying out the experiment and what we have succeeded in showing at least to our satisfaction is that by uh, combining an inexpensive method of measurement with very sophisticated computer analysis you can in fact get very precise heat data dr fleischman do you believe that you have silenced the voices of the critics that have challenged uh, your experimentation to this point with perhaps the new documentation well we hope we shall settle a number of the questions which have been raised, I think that uh, the polarization there has been makes it very unlikely that we can expect to see everybody, uh, uh, suddenly everybody to be convinced I by think, our experimentation. One, I think this will one wants to time. make a prediction. One would say that uh, the major criticism early on was that the method was too simple. Uh, and not precise enough. And I wouldn't want to make a prediction. I think they will now say, well, it's too complicated. So. <laughs> <laughs> Simple but complicated. I mean, it's, it's complete. Too, it's as complete as we know how to make it. I, I think it's... Uh, uh, do, do you regret, Dr. Fleischman, on March 23rd that you made that comment about that, that you felt it was so stupid, the experiment, that you didn't want to proceed with it? 
Has that um, come back to haunt you? <laughs> I think, yes, under, the, uh, under the, uh, the pressure of events, one makes statements which one comes to regret. <laughs> I think we were relatively inexperienced in uh, uh, guarding, making guarded <laughs> comments. We are both inclined to rush in. We, we simply <laughs> had five years' uh, practice with this method and this technique, and uh, at that point we were very mm -hmm. confident that people would see very quickly. Are there, still the are there still surprises in this level of experimentation? Uh, you, you say you've done another round of experiments, another round of documentation to complete that process. Have there still been some discoveries, some oh, yeah. ahas at this point? Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. What have you found new in the last two months? I, I think the major thing we're finding is that the metallurgical properties of the metal is, uh, is an extremely important uh, variable in the, in the success of the experiment. That's the and catalyst uh, element? Uh, the rods themselves, the, exact the electrodes history. themselves, the, the history of the uh, metal itself. And I would add, because we uh, felt compelled to continue experiments over very long durations, our standard experiment time is yeah, three, three months, months yeah. which of course scientists would, uh, doing measurements of heat would not contemplate. But right. because we have continued our experiments for such a long period of time, we found this new phenomenon that our birth in the production of heat. So there is a totally new phenomenon which was discovered because of the con continuation of the experiments. And at this point, at the conclusion of this round of experiments, what new bottom line findings other than the burst of heat? Anything of particular significance to, uh, to adding further cre credibility to the reaction process? I think uh, there's numerous instances now of uh, high levels of sustained heat, not, not bursts, but high levels of uh, of the baseline sustained heat. If, if we had to, to put this into some kind of perspective, it would be safe to say now, even with the critic, that there is no question on the confirmation of the heat, excess heat output, but the big debate still remains on what is producing all of the extra heat. What is the avenue, whatever Absolutely. this avenue is that is producing heat? Absolutely. That is the only unknown at this point. You see, uh, you've got to put yourself in our shoes, and uh, the viewers have to put in our, themselves in our shoes. We expected to find a conventional nuclear reaction plant. And, uh, uh, and this is the line we pursued. And what we found in various cycles of experiments was that we had a great deal of heat and very few nuclear products of the conventional kind. But they were there. They were there in a very minor amount. Now, there must be other reaction plants. But of course, it is extremely difficult to find what those reaction plants are because uh, even the amount of heat you get corresponds to a very small chemical change. So the chemistry required is of a fantastic level of difficulty. Let me ask you uh, briefly about the, <clears throat> these potential uh, nuclear byproducts of a reaction. The Japanese uh, last week uh, had a pronounced announcement <clears throat> claiming that they have achieved cold fusion and and also claiming somewhat that it's, uh, it's completely different, uh, even though it appears to be just a modified version of your own experiments. Yet if you talk to some of the physicists, they will say that they're still more impressed with Kevin Wolf's tritium measurements out of Texas A&M than they are with the Japanese announcement, that that appears to be more convincing for the physicists who have long believed you have to come up with this mm -hmm. tangible byproduct of a, uh, of a, of a nuclear reaction. Well, what is your... your uh, analysis of what has happened in Japan and what the physicists are saying here about Kevin Wolf's uh, measurements at Texas A&M. Um, what is so interesting about uh, the measurements in Texas A&M and the measurements in India especially is that it is quite clear that, that, is the, that you can uh, achieve relatively high levels of tritium this does not exactly please us, incidentally. Mm -hmm. That is what you wanted. Originally. That's not that you what we wanted. That you, and that begin, one can begin to see something of the rationale behind uh, the switching of the path to tritium. But quite clearly, there is much more tritium than would correspond to the neutrons. Now, what is very significant, I think, about the Japanese work is that they have now achieved conditions where clearly you can also get relatively high levels of neutrons. This also doesn't please us, and uh, all we would say <laughs> about that, uh, we understand, we believe what is going on there, and we have, of course, ourselves done some other experiments as well, 
which would lead us to have some confidence in the Japanese. Well. Gentlemen, there's so much to ask and so much to understand about this level of experimentation. Maybe one of the questions that uh, the viewers, that the, the general public has, is what's next? Where do you go in terms of developing this science? We'll explore that in just a minute. Stay with us this afternoon. Uh, we'll be right back uh, as we explore cold fusion on Eyewitness Newsmakers. Welcome back to Eyewitness Newsmakers. The subject this afternoon, cold fusion. The experimentation, of course, at the University of Utah and the gentlemen that uh, are responsible for that experiment are with us today. We'd like to introduce uh, Dr. the University of Utah and also Dr. Martin Fleischman with uh, England Southampton University, also now a research scientist at the University of Utah. And also joining us today is eyewitness uh, science specialist Ed Yates. And Dr. Pons, if I can ask you to begin with, uh, Tell us a little of where you envision both the experimentation and the development of the concept of cold fusion, the science of cold fusion. What's the next step as you envision it? Well, our work is, is going to be focused on a very large-scale experiment of investigating the parameters which are significant in the uh, experiment. We know what most of these parameters are. We know what uh, chemicals should be used in the system that may be better or worse than the ones we started with. Uh, so we need to develop a very large scale number of experiments to investigate what changing these parameters will do to the amount of heat at which we observe. So we have uh, developed a large matrix uh, of experiments. Uh, they are underway now uh, at the center here in Salt Lake. And uh, those ex first round of experiments will run about three months. And at that point, we should have a great deal of information uh, about the path which we need to follow to develop a, uh, a demonstration device. As you, as you work towards this goal of trying mm -hmm. to come up with a demonstration device, <clears throat> how real is the competitive threat that now is, is evident apparently from Japan and some other countries that, uh, that you can stay on top of this and not have them surpass? Without, without major federal funding, uh, it will be impossible, literally impossible. I mean, the scope of the experiments that need to be done uh, in that area uh, is enormous, and if you extrapolate what by the number of scientists which are, we understand are working on that project in Japan and India, uh, then you can easily come up with hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, anticipate that they're using hundreds of millions of dollars of research funds uh, in this area right now. Is DOE considering that level of funding, the Department DOE, of Energy? DOE is considering none, yeah, not a penny. I mean, for, you know, specifically set aside for this research area, I think they would entertain uh, small individual uh, research projects, but it's, uh, it's going to be too, it's too late for that. Why is that? Why do, why do you believe that uh, there's that level of lack of interest uh, at the federal level in this country? Apparently we stepped on some toes. <laughs> that, that's, that's it's not in our area. It's not, uh, you know, nuclear physics is, uh, we're not nuclear physics. Why do you say that? Do you, I mean, that's, that's a pretty substantial charge. Well, there's a half a billion dollars. Uh, being spent annually in that area, and uh, I'm afraid that... Uh... No, I'm quite happy with uh, the spend of that money. I think the research which is being done in the high done. energy nuclear physics area is splendid. It's, I've always said that it must continue. The, sure. the sound physical principles involved, and we want to see what, uh, the, what uh, that type of research can lead to. But there are other pieces of research which have to be carried out, and one mustn't have a very narrow-minded attitude about investigations of novel techniques. And we are not unique in that. I mean, there have been many other proposals to try and induce fusion processes or nuclear reactions in general. That must, that must be maddening, though, if you believe that, uh, that someone, that the federal government or some agency would stand in the way of uh, this level of research because perhaps a protocol was not followed to the, mm -hmm. in the norm. I think that it, it is just, I, I would say that the level of funding in the United States of uh, innovative research is too low. And this is just a symptom, and you could cite many other examples, and if the level of funding falls below a certain point, then you will have these controversies. Do you believe that <clears throat> this, uh, this conflict uh, that we're seeing now is developing a dangerous precedent that... Uh, Pure science somehow, new ideas, new concepts, and the, this, uh, this philosophy of pure science gets lost in the politics and the jealousies and the egos over money and the foreign countries 
take the pure science and run away with it and run away with the patents and everything else? Those phenomena have always been <laughs> part of science policy. This is not nothing especially new. I think... Uh, uh, is it getting worse? Uh, yes, it is getting worse because the level of funding is inadequate. I think it is true to say that the National Science Foundation will only fund 7% of all new applications, new applications from uh, 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 new assistant professors. Now, in that situation, you are bound to get com many conflicts. This is inevitable. And I think that at some stage, one has to take a cool look at uh, the whole funding policy. Have you, have you made a specific request to the Department of Energy and been denied that level of, uh, or any level of funding at this point? We made a request to the Department of Energy, and um, which, in fact, was part of the story, the developing story. Uh, in the end, we did not take up the funding which was allocated. And in any case, I think the needs now are so large that they cannot be covered by that type of funding mechanism. At some stage, you, one has to take a decision to uh, investigate the phenomenon in a comprehensive way, and that cannot be f uh, covered by the existing mechanisms. What should, ha I'm sorry, uh, uh, I just, I just did a follow-up here to Doug's question. What, what is the risk of the Department of Energy, say, funding a government laboratory, but then the results of that work uh, do not become published uh, because it's a government lab and because there may be motives on why that research should be done? I mean, is there a risk that that may happen? But me. <laughs> well, certainly uh, there's been a lot of there's been a lot of work that has not been published yes. uh, out of the national labs. That's that's a fact. But, uh, you think there must always be a duality or um, uh, a multiplicity of research efforts. That is the only safe uh, strategy and tactic to adopt in research in general. You should never. Uh, put all your eggs in one basket. Right. Yeah. Uh, it is new ideas, different ideas, uh, so you must have a multiplicity of funding, you must have a multiplicity of ideas, and a multiplicity of publication media. And the national authorities, have, of course, have a very important role in that. I don't mean to belabor this point. Let me ask one other question, then we'll move on. Do you believe that the federal government, that the Department of Energy has a lid on this in terms of the development of the concept of cold fusion have, has your experimentation gone about as far as it feasibly can without some major additional funding? And it, by denying that funding, is the lid being kept on this? The innovative, the innovative research uh, will have to come to a halt, yes. The, uh, investigating new possibilities, uh, major significant uh, discoveries, going after things like that will have to be terminated, yes. And, what, and what's your reaction to that? Well, it's appalling. I think it's appalling. Now, if that happens, <coughs> What are the chances of the Japanese walking away with the, some of the patent rights if they can continue to keep staying ahead of the research in this country? We have covered uh, as heavily as we have been able to all areas of this work in, in the university patents. But since we still don't know precisely the mechanism that's going, you know, that's developing this spot, it may be something totally different than, than what we've speculated. We don't know that. We don't think so, but it could be, and we won't be the ones to find out. In that case, we could definitely lose that right. I think it is unrealistic to think that uh, uh, in a development of this kind, you can protect yourself completely. Forever. I mean, it yeah. is, if it turns out to be useful, it's interesting science, and mm -hmm. there are obviously many ifs behind it, if it turns out to be useful, then, of course, it will involve many countries, many research scientists, many organizations. So, what, but what one would like to see is an adequate uh, development in the United States and in Utah, say, and wherever that may, and in other laboratories in the United States, uh, and that requires a different approach to the one which has been followed here. You see, up to a point, you could say that there has been a fair amount of money spent in the United States, but it is all at sixes and sevens. The Japanese, of course, great credit to them, organize their work in, in a well-structured manner and say, suppose this is right, what should we do? And that's the path they follow. They don't Here's the path, they suppose it is wrong, what should we do? Let's not prove it's wrong, just make the assumption it's right. You're going to spend the money anyway. 
to prove it's wrong, you might as well try to do something with it. Obviously, the competition for these rights is big business. The big business of coal fusion, I guess you could say. We'll explore a little more of that. And also, uh, I know part of your concern is the polarization of attitudes regarding the experimentation on both sides of this. We'll talk about those topics coming up. Stay with us on Eyewitness Newsmakers. Welcome back to Eyewitness Newsmakers. Coal fusion, our topic today. The research developed at the University of Utah and the developers of that uh, concept and research are with us this afternoon. Dr. Stanley Pons with the University of Utah and Dr. Martin Flashman with uh, England Southampton University, also a research scientist at the University of Utah. And also with us today is Eyewitness News science specialist Ed Yates. Ed? Gentlemen, let me, let me ask you if this announcement of your research work had not occurred in a public press conference on March 23rd, would it have followed a more secure path? Um, uh, would it have been safer to follow a policy where it was not a, a released in the public press? In a piece, in any piece of research, and especially in such a sensitive area, it is always better to be later rather than earlier. So it would have been better, but in my opinion, the same momentum would still have built up. You would have gone the same path, it no matter when you made the announcement. Or... But how has dealing with the public press affected working on the science? Having to deal with the criticism, uh, the papers the, the, that are questioning your work? Well, you have so much energy to spend on a given thing each day. I mean, you don't have an infinite supply. And we, found, we find that uh, a lot of our energy is wasted by 8 o'clock in the morning answering faxes, telephone calls, uh, things like this, bad news, good news. It's a real roller coaster. So it has a, definitely affected our ability to uh, get a lot of science done in the last few months. It's if, getting better. If we had been, uh, if we had published later, the first paper later, we would have been in a better position to correct misapprehensions. Mm -hmm. But if you have a limited amount of time, you cannot counteract the impression which is generated during the polarization of opinion. If you had to look into a crystal ball, <clears throat> where, would, where do you see fusion in 1990, in the next 12 months? Hmm. Well, we know where we want to be. Where do you want to be by 1990? Uh, where do you want to be by We the want end? to be on a, in a secure base to uh, devise a demonstration. That is what our immediate objective is. This would be a device that's putting out energy that yes. is useful. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so that you can demonstrate the phenomenon in an easy way, not in a sophisticated way, but an on the table. An ambiguous way. In an easy and ambiguous There's way. There's been a lot of challenges uh, to your uh, professional research. Do you, what do you say to your critics at this point? Uh, to the people, I mean, you live in this community, a community that takes a great deal of pride in what was developed at the university, uh, the concept of this. Well, how do you answer them, Dr. Pons, at this point? Well, we simply say that there cannot be literally hundreds now of systematic errors uh, because, of, you know, that's at least the number of positive reports and confirmations that have come along and other developments. So we deny that uh, there can be that many systematic errors which people say that, you know, the, our critics say that the results are wrong. They're not wrong. And I think it's been confirmed enough now. And, uh, you know, the, the, our response is, if it is right, you know, there's going to be a problem. Gentlemen, we're, al large problem. we're almost out of time. Uh, if I can just ask you as we close, uh, has your conviction to cold fusion, the process, that the, has that changed at all, Dr. Fleischman? Not at all. I think we uh, would say we, the polarization made us look more positive than we were. We do not know the exact nuclear paths. We are convinced there are nuclear processes going on. And Dr. Bonds? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. No question. Yeah. At all. Gentlemen, we thank you for sharing your time and uh, uh, in a tremendously interesting subject, and we hope to visit with you again soon. And